my name is Marcel. It's not the first time I've done that. My name is Marcel, and I'm partially a shell, as you can see on my body, but I also have shoes, and... The true origin story was that Jenny and I were sharing a hotel room with like five other people for a friend's wedding and Jenny started doing this very tiny voice. One time I went to a hotel to express how like cramped she felt. And guess what the bed was made out of? What? A muffin. Then we were kind of fascinated by it. It just kept making us laugh. Sounds like a fancy hotel. It was, but we split the room and we actually slept eight to the muffin. <laughs> <laughs> Then when we got home, I had completely forgotten that I agreed to make a video for my friend's comedy show. And he went to the local toy store and bought a Polly Pocket. It was like a rip-off Polly Pocket set. And some googly eyes. I went to the craft store, bought a tub of shells. And took the shoes from the Polly Pocket and one of the googly eyes and created Marcel. So I started interviewing Jenny in, in that tiny voice. And he said, what's your name? And because the universe made me say it, I guess, I said, uh, my name is Marcel, and I'm partially a shell, as you can see on my body, but I also have shoes. And we screened it, and the only reason that I like put it on the internet is because my friend asked if she could send it to her mom. So that was, that was how it found its way to the internet, and then it kind of blew up from there. Is this normal for no, you? No, this never happens. It's 22 so cool. million? It's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, it's a broad, broad spectrum of emotions. I didn't even know there were that many people. You guys seen Marcel the Shell? It's a YouTube video. Marcel the Shell with shoes it's on. It's been viewed over 20 million times. Things About Me is now a New York Times bestseller. The movie has been like a much longer genesis. We wanted to figure out a way to tell a story that felt true to us and didn't feel like we were selling out this character who had become very special to us. But I didn't know that you were gonna have a camera and I wish that you had said that you were gonna be here today because I didn't I didn't clean up. <laughs> I'd been doing a lot of stuff with documentary and that was where my interest had gone and when I realized like I was looking back I was like oh yeah Marcel was also like a documentary essentially even the shorts were contextualized that way. So we started with the audio play, which was a bit of an experiment when we started, but now I'm like very, very happy that we committed to that. Okay. Is he going to the jail? <laughs> no. Oh, phew. Is he going to the jail? <laughs> no. So audio production was just as bare bones as you can imagine. It was me and Jenny and Isabella Rossellini and Nick and some of our producers. From the very beginning of the writing process for this movie, we knew we wanted to feel like a documentary, to feel like very not written. Um, but it turns out that required way more writing than uh, a traditional film because we wanted the scenes and moments that ended up in the movie to feel like they were plucked from Marcel and Connie's real life, so we had to create that reality in order to make the, the pared down film. So Dean and I would write for three to four months, and then we'd take that and record for a day with Jenny, and she would do incredible improv around that. And then Dean and I would take that audio, edit it down, write around that new material for a couple more months, take it back to set, record with Jenny and Isabella for a day, go back, edit it, write around it, and so on. And in this way, we took this giant um, vineyard of material and made this glass of wine. And, and I think it wildly succeeds in feeling like a documentary and hiding our work. What are you trying to do with all this? Um, I'm making like a little documentary that I might put online. For me to perform my work as character of Marcel, those moments for me are moments of total creative confidence and freedom. Those are times when I, I just feel like um, an Olympian or something. Like I know exactly how to do it. Like I've been training my whole life to be this character. We had this homemade audio rigging that was like a really dorky headband with a microphone stuck onto it. I don't know how many hours of recorded audio we have, but tons of it is on the cutting room floor. The improv was there to actually bring it alive and that we're actually doing something living. It's such a beautiful, living, breathing thing in that way. We get to just be like true collaborators where we're just like, I don't remember if you did that hilarious thing that's making me laugh or if someone else did or whatever. Just go out there and really try to do your best to make the movie better. <laughs> so after we finalized the audio play, the, I essentially went off and storyboarded with Kirsten. I got 
much more involved at that point. It was really just Dean and I working on storyboards and just drawing like every shot of the movie. It's pretty remarkable. In the boards themselves, in the animatic, you actually have your heartstrings pulled. You're laughing, you're, you're joking, you're getting to love Marcel. And then Nana Connie and her issues, you start to really feel this empathy. And, and that's in the animatic. I think it was three years we worked on the animatic. <laughs> Which sounds like an insanely long time, but just felt like if we can get this to work emotionally, story-wise, um, in animatic form, then it would definitely work as a real film. The character design process was actually pretty extensive. We really just found that we worked better when we had physical objects in front of us, just kind of like Frankenstein some some new things, because that's really how Marcel was created. Now I feel like there's so many characters that are only on screen for like one second. Pencil Mouse is one of my favorites. Aunt Judy. I just really hope that they get their own spin-off. <laughs> At that point, we really just started moving into live action production. And action. That was kind of a whole other side of things that was really exciting. Look at this. It's real. The most unique about it was that for most of the scenes, we already have the performance captured in the audio play. So a lot of the time, you're trying to either engineer camera movements or engineer blocking that feel like they would motivate the audio that already exists. Just sort of a weird backwards way of making a movie. <laughs> Stop motion can sometimes be very mechanical and it's so kind of technical. For that particular step, it's like a little bit more, more than that. Yeah. So that then we could I wanted to push us to do something that was more organic, that you know had rack focuses and handheld motion and all the things that make a documentary feel textured. <laughs> Over time, it was a meeting of the minds. I mean, we were entrenched in more of a traditional way of producing stop motion animation on a stage. And Dean wanted this, had this vision of more of a documentary style. It's definitely not a traditional shoot. Action tomato. There are some traditional aspects, obviously, but you have a little Marcel, which is really adorable. So we have an animated character in a documentary live action world. And it is truly extraordinary. I've never seen anything quite like it. Action. Shooting in this way also allowed us to work with just some really amazing people and improvise with them and, you know, really get to base the characters around them. We all watch 60 Minutes as a community. Leslie Shaw. She likes Leslie Stahl. I particularly uh, love the relationship between Marcel and his grandmother. I obviously am interested in the subject and interviewed a lot of grandmothers who would just love to have that relationship. So many don't get a chance to. The character of Nana Connie, I, I think of as uh, an amalgam of my grandmother's and Dean's grandmother. She's a very, very special, precious combination of the matriarchy in both of our lives. And also you get to see uh, Isabella Rossellini as a shell. When the kush hit, kush? What is Kush? <laughs> she showed up to a really unique situation. Here is like the face of Lancome with like a, <laughs> a microphone taped to a sweatband and didn't bat an eye. She had, she had lots of questions, which was really wonderful. Like she had a ton of curiosity. She was saying to me that she learned the rules of our world as she was performing her character. And she gave us everything. It was really cool. <laughs> I mean, not to sound like a teenager, but it was really cool. She was completely there for us. And you can see that. You can hear it. It's funny, we've made this movie three times. <laughs> <laughs> Took the, all the audio tracks, cut them all together, and then created a, an animatic, a living cartoon of it. Then they went off and shot the live action. And now we get to come back and put in Marcel for the third version of it. Yeah. Do you mind if I just plop into it real quick? Sure. <laughs>
The way I've been describing the animation process is imagine how any movie with a CG character gets made. You shoot the live action plates and the effects artists using computers model and composite the CG character into the live action footage, right? Now imagine that instead of a computer, what you have is a second shoot, a stop motion shoot, and it's physical, it's on a stage, and everything has to match perfectly with the live action footage that you shot. So the camera movement, the parallax on Marcel, uh, focal length of the lenses you're using, all of the lighting has to match perfectly or it won't work. We have animators in here working right now. So while they're working, it's sort of, we treat it the same way that we treat uh, an actor doing a take in live action. You don't want to step in and distract them in the middle. They kind of get in the zone. Well, right from the start, I think the challenge for us was to maintain that that quality that Dean had created. I mean, there's an innocence and it was a handmade quality that we wanted to make sure that an increased production value didn't take that away. To be able to kind of take this object and like really kind of make it into something alive is an amazing feeling. This was like a test print, just like in a gray resin to make sure everything like looks good in the physical world. It's striated and like to your naked eye, it doesn't seem like it's much, but once you get it on camera, you really see all of the striations from the printing process. So we had to go through and sand all of these by hand. And then, so this is like a final Marcel after he's been sanded and everything. We go through and put in a spray coating just to kind of make it nice and smooth. And then maybe you can see there's like tiny highlights that are painted in by hand with like a satin to kind of give like that shell texture. So the light picks it up really nice. And this is the final pair of shoes. Dean wanted them all to be dirty because they only have one pair of shoes for their whole life. Chef step and then like really gets in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> From a technical standpoint, I'm like really eager to show people the lengths that we went to on stage because I think you just would never assume watching the final film that that's how that was done. <laughs> Every single object that Marcel interacts with has to be recreatable and animatable. The couch, for example, you have to shoot that couch and then you have to take that onto an animation stage and essentially gut it and fill it with materials that look exactly identical but can be animated. These characters are real small so they don't have any weight. When the characters jump down and they land on that seat, something has to push them into the ground. So what we've done is we've created an apparatus that sits in the sofa cushions that an animator can then pull down and push up and we have maybe 35 points on each cushion to be able to push up and pull down. These are our strawberry leaves. Here's some real ones. And these are ones that we made. We have all these molds that we've made. And I just pop that in the vacuum form and then it uh, puts plastic over the top of it, like a little cap, and I trim it out and then we just paint it. We take a real strawberry, we make a mold of it, we paint it, dress it up. I've made uh, some of the stem and the leaves here. This is made out of wire and this is made out of black wrap. So yeah, everything's made from scratch. I think the hope is that the viewers won't be able to tell how these stop motion creatures that definitely have like that handmade animation quality to them, but how that works in a real world with handheld cameras and real props that they're interacting with and real people that they're interacting with. A lot of it, like matching the lighting, came down to Eric, our stop motion DP, uh, who was on set every single day, taking just meticulous really detailed notes and then he faithfully recreated all of those exact conditions on our stages it's unimaginable in this car shot you know we shot real footage of us driving and when we went around this corner in the live action plate the light obviously changed because the orientation to the sun changed so then eric had to examine that movement and then recreate what the shadow movement would have been on stage when we get to this point in the shot this shadow starts moving which required you know a, a mo motion control mechanism that's sliding the lights around to actually control the... And these are also super impressive too. All these little flickers and stuff all line up with, you know, where we passed a palm tree or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's psychotic. It's truly psychotic. It's a crazy way to make a movie, but it's gonna be beautiful. How many times a day do you throw up in your car? Yeah, so this is stage zero. This is where we've done all of our ice skating shots. Marcel skates by putting dust on a coffee table and then everyone can skate around. But this is all like real dust, so we have to be extremely careful when we're animating. 
because there's no going back. If any other director had made this movie, it would be a disaster. He's pushed us to do things that we would say, no way, you can't do that. If a, a traditional stop motion director had come in and done this, it would have been ordinary. I think what's important is that when people watch this movie is that Marcel is real. They shouldn't be thinking about all the technical things that went into making him real when they see him on the screen. He's there. He's a real little creature who's interacting with Dean and the other people in the movie. The movie's about community. It's about getting your community back. Like, I feel like that's something that everyone can relate to. He's always looking on the bright side of things. He's self-possessed and confident, and he's such a great example of how to like live life positively. <laughs> I've been working on this movie for six years and there's been, it's been several times in my life over the course of that process where I've communed with the ideas in this movie and felt uplifted by them. I think there's a lot of rehabilitation built in to what Dean and I did and it is for sure the creative endeavor that I'm the most proud of. It's so personal. It's just a, at its core, it's a very intimate personal movie, and I can't say we've ever worked on anything this intimate. At its core, it's a real movie. It's about truth. It's about family. It's about isolation. It's about finding out who you are and how you're going to go get through life. And I think everybody's going to identify that. It has a lot of truths, real strong truths that people identify with. Even though it's taken so long to like tell his story, I think it's something that people are really going to relate to and really love, and it just has so much heart, you know? It's like, we need that now. Everybody needs that so much now. I get a little too, yeah. I still cry at the animatic. It's been like over a year. I just hope that people come away feeling uplifted and touched by such a human story that's told by a little, a little thing that's not really human. It is a movie about what it's like to be unapologetically alive, how that looks when one is navigating great losses, unexpected gains, deep, strong emotion. I think this movie says that change is scary, joy is precious, and all of those things occur at once in a natural and heartbreaking symphony and that although we can't know what everybody else is going through, we know what it's like to try to get through. This movie shows that it's all sort of framed up in the shape of a smile, if you will. You know, you're welcome back here anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs>